Welcome, welcome, welcome to another OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast. My name is Brandon Drum. I'm here with Parker Thune. Camp and season Gunza. is season cut off back. season. Tomorrow, big camp. We'll discuss that. There's there's some names coming, but uh, also I'm more... not this I'm not this pale. I just have a farmer tan. There, you can see it. Fair enough. I think I join you on that. Look that. Uh -huh. I'm not quite as white as it's you are naturally, escapable. but yep. But um, all right. Um, big visit weekend took place. Uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We will discuss that. Obviously, Oklahoma landed a Rivals 150 wide receiver and Marcus Harris out of modern day. And we're going to talk about all of that. We're going to talk about Lloyd Picard. We're going to talk about Michael Fasusi, the five-star offensive lineman. Um, we're going to talk about trying to think of uh, who else was on campus, man, off the top of my head here. Um, there were eight official visitors. There were eight. Anyway, well, we're going to talk want... about all of them. I'll pull the list up here in a second. I was about to say, you want me to run down the list? Because I can't. No, we'll list. pull it up here in a second. I'll talk about it here. And we'll talk about all that here in just a second. But first, we need to get to some ads, uh, pay some bills, and then we will dive right into how Oklahoma has started off with some strong momentum on the recruiting trail uh, during the official visits. Go ahead, Parker. Yes, folks. But first, this episode of the Under the Visor podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to announce that Smooth Sack Summer is officially upon us. When you're playing in the summer sun, make sure you're groomed. Thanks to our friends at Manscaped, you can make this season your smoothest yet. The Performance Package 5.0 Ultra is the ultimate bundle to keep your boys downstairs cool while looking hot. Join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our exclusive offer. More on that in just a second. But... The Manscaped Performance Package 5.0 Ultra has everything you need to prepare that summer bot. Every man knows how scary it can get when going for a close shave below the belt. That's why I trust Manscaped for all my sensitive areas. Inside this package, you'll find the star of the show, the Lawnmower 5.0, which also features dual LED spotlights to provide contrast on multiple skin tones, three length setting combs, and oh, did I mention this trimmer is waterproof too. Beach, lake, or shower, this razor will devour even the strongest cubes. And now that you have the perfect haircut, use Manscaped's liquid formulations to keep that freshness even at the hottest summer barbecues. The Crop Soother Aftershave Lotion and Crop Preserver Anti-Chafe Ball Deodorant. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts to the Performance Package 5.0, the Manscaped Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag. Now, you can get 20% off and free shipping with the code OUinsider at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code OUinsider at manscaped.com. It's smooth sack summer, boys. Get on board or get left behind. I don't even know how to follow that, but all right. Um, you don't have to. We can go straight into talking about recruiting. That's the good well, news. You don't want to talk about smooth sacks? <laughs> all right. Um, speaking of smooth. Emmett Jones, he's a smooth. Yeah, and operator. speaking of sacks too. Wait, what? What type of sacks are we talking about? What type of sacks are you talking about? I don't know what's going on. All right, all That's, right. Uh... Hey, bearing the lead here, <laughs> let's let's move on here with the uh, Marcus Harris commitment out of modern day, the Rivals one fifty wide receiver. Guys, folks. Sooners fans, this came out of thin air. Obviously, yeah. the relationship was being built by Emma Jones, but there was a small chance that we believed that that was ever going to take place. Next thing you know, Marcus Harris has taken an official visit. Shortly after that, he's committed to Oklahoma. And here's the thing, man. You're right. This did come out of thin air, but... In a way, Emmett Jones had been laying the groundwork for exactly this for such a long time because he does this, man. Emmett Jones does this. I'll tell you right now, last summer when the Sooners had five wide receivers committed, Emmett Jones had at least two more that were basically trying to break down his door to get in the class at Oklahoma. Emmett Jones does this, man. He always has backup plans for his backup plans lined up. And when we talked to Marcus Harris earlier today, he said, it. he said, listen, 
Emmett Jones and I stayed in contact throughout the entirety of the recruitment process. There were never, there was never a time where we lost contact for any prolonged period of time. Now, obviously the, the love wasn't really there for me the way it was at some of my other schools, but I eventually got to the point where I felt like, Hey, I needed to go check Oklahoma out. And well, (laughs) he goes to check Oklahoma out on his official visit, Brandon. And that was the only experience he needed. And listen, I know what the rejoinder from Texas fans has been. Well, he wasn't a priority. He was down the board. Is that true? Okay, sure. It probably is. Looking at some of the other wide receivers that Texas is in the running for, I get it if Marcus Harris was like priority five or six. I'm not here to dispute that. But I guarantee you, the Sooners did not just land Marcus Harris because everybody else decided to pull off him. That's a top 150 player in the country. Brandon, that's not a guy you just luck into. It's not. I mean, look, I know there was some fodder from the other side of the Red River that Texas just let go of Rivals 150 guy that they had been pushing for. And I'm going to go ahead and call BS on that. I just am. Like, I get it. If you lose, it's it's awesome. If you lose to the other side, and Oklahoma is just as guilty, I'm sure we're just as guilty as sometimes of saying that thing to kind of save face for the program, right? Because it happens. Um, I don't think we do it on purpose, but I think the intel we're given, oh, yeah, well, we backed off. Come on, man. The reality is, is you're not backing off a talent like that. Like, this guy was a five-star for the longest time. And things have taken place. He's, other names have come to the forefront, but he's still a top 150 kid in the country, which means he's freaking elite, Parker. Elite, elite. Mm-hmm. He comes from modern day, which you know he's going to be... How often do modern day guys not pan out? I mean, uh, they pan out. Generally, um, yes. Generally, they pan out, yes. So, like, I just find it hard to believe that Texas is going to sit there and go, you know what? We don't want a one fifty top one fifty kid from modern day high school. We don't want to keep digging our our heels into that program and make it a pipeline of all pipelines for the University of Texas. We're going to go find somebody else that may not be as good because we think he's better. I call BS. I call BS. You may think somebody's better. I want you to point that out somebody that they're going after that they're like, that's way better. That guy's way better. And yes, I understand Mr. Duncanville, you know, is, is on their list. I get it. As is Jamie French. Yes. French is as well. But if Marcus Harris called the day and said, I want to be a Longhorn, there's zero chance that Sarkeesian goes, yeah, no, we're not going to make room for you. That's, that's my point. So, and it's just felt like to me, like it, it's a way to kind of depreciate the play that Oklahoma made there to get Marcus Harris, which is what you do when it's your arch rival that does that, right? Oklahoma does it. Yeah. Look, look, like it's if what Texas, they do. If Texas wants to shoot for the stars at wide receiver, that's great. That's fine. Yeah. Like more power to you. But both things can be true, right? Marcus Harris wasn't a hip top priority for Texas at wide receiver. Sure. That can be true. And it can also be true that Marcus Harris is a really freaking good football player with a lot of powerhouse Mm. offers. You look at his top five, Georgia was in there. Oregon was in there. Michigan was in there. Obviously Texas was in like, this is a kid that had, he didn't necessarily have his pick of the litter in the sense that he could go anywhere. But a lot of the offers that we regard as big time offers in this day and age, Brandon, Marcus Harris had them. And yet it took Emmett Jones four days to say, hey, come on down until the kid decided I'm an Oklahoma Sooner. And that's the to me, that's the crazy part about it is. Oklahoma really wasn't even in his top five. And then all of the sudden 
He's taking an OV and committing to Oklahoma. That is the power of Emma Jones. They now have a two top 150 wide receivers and a four-star wide receiver committed with more left, right? Like you got Cortez Mills still on the board. Oklahoma making a strong push yeah. for Cortez Mills, right? You got Emmanuel Choice, strong push. You have Andrew Marsh, strong push. Oklahoma, if I'm a betting man, I think they land two of the three. I don't think they take all three, but no. I think they'll take two of the three. I think they'll take five. And, and here's I, why. Yeah, and Go you ahead. just you you couldn't get all three. You, no, you well, couldn't. You, you, I guess you could, but you I think could, it just you couldn't convince all six guys on board at that point to stick. Yeah. That's what, yeah. I guess you could get them to commit. You're pushing the limit with five. Six is impossible. Yeah. Six is impossible. But look, I have a manual choice future cast to Oklahoma even mm -hmm. before he shows up for the official visit this weekend. I feel good about where Oklahoma sits in that race. And yeah, they're making a surge for Cortez Mills. I have no idea what happens with Andrew Marsh right now. Nobody has any idea what happened no. with Andrew Marsh. Anybody tells you they know what the outcome of Andrew Marsh's recruitment is going to be right now, they're lying to you. Uh, because... I think there's one person. That's Mike West that knows what's going to happen with Andrew Marsh. He might and that's know, because, that, he that's might know because where things stand very, right now. Yeah. I don't know that anybody knows what's going on. I guess to that's fair. I guess that's fair. Yeah. I guess that's fair. I think he probably, he, he will know before everybody else. Now, but, um, uh, so I, I talked to Cortez Mills. Uh, well, this, this will drop on a Tuesday morning. So let's call it yesterday that I talked to Cortez Mills. Um, <laughs> Oh, you made a move there, man. And yeah. he's going to go to Miami this coming weekend. The Hurricanes are kind of in a similar boat to Texas to where they're really trying to land a special class at wide out. And they're trying, you know, they're shooting for the moon. And Can I ask you this real quick best. before you dive into that? Can I ask you this? You, you brought up something. You keep talking about shooting for the moon, in which I think both those programs are 100% doing that. Yeah. But... When you bring you say special class, if Oklahoma lands Cortez Mills, Grayson Harris, Elijah Thomas, Marcus Harris, and Emmanuel Choice, is that not special? No, that that is a special class. That's an amazing class. There's two ways I mean, to go. There's different ways to go about it. I guess is my point. Well, and like two guys in particular, I just think the world of as prospects are Elijah Thomas and Manny Choice. Agreed. And all five of them are really, really good. But those are two of my favorites in the 25 class, man. Mm -hmm. Love those dudes and love their game. But uh, Cortez Mills, as I mentioned, is going back to the U this weekend. It's going to be his last official. I'm not expecting this recruitment to last much more than another few weeks at this point in time. I get the sense a decision is coming pretty soon for Cortez Mills. It's basically three schools right now. Yes, he's OV'd to Florida and Nebraska. Yes, those schools are technically in the mix. But right now, it's about OU, Clemson, and Miami. Two of those schools are very, very similar. One is kind of the black sheep, right? Because mm -hmm. OU and Clemson, those are the two culture schools in college football. Those are the two preeminent culture schools. And Miami's close to home. Uh, Miami roots, uh, I'm sorry, recruits wide receivers very well historically, especially recently. And, you know, they have they have their methods of doing so, certainly. But the Miami love makes sense. Uh, it certainly makes sense that the Hurricanes are still in the picture here for Cortez Mills. But I think it's really, really interesting that there haven't been all that many OU Clemson battles on the recruiting trail over the course of the Venables era, save for over dudes that Venables recruited to both places, recruited while he was at Clemson and then continued recruiting on behalf of Oklahoma. I think of guys like Sammy Brown and Drew Woodass, right? Even and people will bring up Bryant Wesco. Bryant Wesco wasn't really a Clemson Oklahoma battle. I mean, heck, I remember at the time when he shut it down and committed to Clemson out of nowhere. The thought was kind of that he was going to TCU at that point. That's where the buzz mm -hmm. was. So we have seen very few heads up OU versus Clemson battles. And again, Miami's the third school in the mix. So I don't know if you can really call it a straight up OU Clemson battle right now. 
And if Miami decides to unload for Cortez Mills, right, there's a very good chance that they can wind up getting Cortez Mills. But it seems to me that the two schools he is highest on right now, and I know there are others across the industry that uh, share this belief, feels like he really likes Clemson and he really likes Oklahoma. And I went into the weekend under the impression that Clemson led, but I really do think Mm -hmm. OU put a big dent in Clemson's lead. Mm -hmm. He loves Emmett Jones. Shocker of all shockers, right? And I specific, when I talked to him, I specifically asked about the time that he spent with Emmett Jones in the film room, because if you'll recall a common thread for a lot of guys that have committed to Oklahoma to play wide receiver over the course of Jones's tenure on staff is they all seemingly point to their time in the film room with Emmett Jones as a turning point. And Mills was pretty, like he was on top of it when I asked that question. He said, yeah, look, he pointed out to me how he can develop me, how he can refine my game, how I can make an impact at Oklahoma. And it was great. It was odd. Like it, we really connected over that. And so Emmett Jones has is certainly the centerpiece, the focal point of Oklahoma's recruitment of Cortez Mills in that he is the main factor that's driving the interest there from Mills's end. But also, Mills got to spend a lot of time around Marcus Harris this past mm-hmm. weekend. And, of course, Marcus Harris is now in Oklahoma sooner, Brandon. Those two developed a really good report. When I talked to Mills, he said, yeah, Marcus, that's my dog. So if Marcus Harris stays in Cortez Mills' ear and he starts, or I, I, I should say he continues to develop that rapport with Oklahoma's newly minted wide receiver commit, and he has that trust in Emmett Jones, man, I, I think it's too early to call the race, and I wouldn't put a prediction down, but – there's certainly a path to where Oklahoma come decision day for Cortez Mills is in the driver's seat to land him. That is not out of the realm of possibility at all. Uh, that would be huge. And then obviously I think at that point, if you're Oklahoma, just, um, hold on. Yeah. Just, just got something as far as a uh, fluid record. I'm texting with some folks. Um, but I, I the the interesting part's gonna be with Andrew Marsh, right? Like in a man, in manual choice. It feels like if you end up with Cortez Mills and you already have Marcus Harris, and obviously you got Elijah Thomas and Grayson Harris already committed to you, you've got between the two, you've got to push for a manual choice, right? Like that's gotta be the push you need that big rangy target right like that's got to be the play if you're oklahoma correct i i agree and look if i if i'm kind of putting together a short list of guys who would be on commit watch heading into this weekend cj nixon is obviously at the top of the list but i wouldn't say emmanuel choice is very far down the list as i said i like where they sit with choice i think they've got a shot with mills Look, Emmett's in too deep with Andrew Marsh. Like he's not at no point is he going to pull back from recruiting Andrew Marsh because of how long he's been uh, trying to swing that in OU's favor. That's a year and a half of recruiting, legitimately a year and a half of recruiting the kid to Oklahoma. Pretty much from Mm -hmm. the minute Emmett Jones got on staff, he's been recruiting uh, Andrew Marsh to OU. But the question becomes if, say, Best case scenario, choice is on board shortly after the barbecue and you get Mills. Let's say next month rolls around, Mills makes a decision and it's an OU's favorite. And that's wide receiver number five. Mm -hmm. Do you really push for Mark? Because I think one way or another, that's the one that's going to last the longest out of the three. I think his recruitment's going to last the longest because look, like, the kid and his camp are playing the game, and they've been playing the game throughout the whole process, and they have been making the absolute most of it, milking it for all it's worth. The kid's taking a midweek official visit to Kentucky this week, Brandon. It's like, like are you really going to go to Kentucky? What are the odds you commit to Kentucky? Very slim. It's so very in my slim. estimation. But to my point, they're milking it for all it's worth. 
But I think you have two guys here in Emmanuel Choice and Cortez Mills that are getting real close to a decision. If you get those two or even one of those two, I mm-hmm. think at that point you can kind of start to ease up if you're in Emmett Jones shoes and you don't have to keep the pedal to the metal necessarily because you're going to have four really talented wide receivers in your class. And if you add one more, great. If not, shoot, man, you can yeah. be okay with that. No doubt. Um I I think I want to talk about Ihena Cornell. Okay. Obviously, um just as far as how that visit went, and let me pull up everything I have on him real quick. But um Mark Ihenacor, obviously he's a teammate of one Jaden O'Neill, twenty twenty six, you know, yeah. top one hundred player in the country, top potential five-star quarterback in 2026, Oklahoma's big leader. He cancels his visit to Washington earlier today. And I don't know if this has more to do with Zadarius Rainey sale, or if it has to do with Oklahoma making just a strong push here, which. Well, it, I'll it, tell it, you, I. Go ahead. And I, I spoke to Ihenna Gore earlier today, or Ihenna, Ihenna Chore. I got to make Ihenna it. Chore. Ihenna Chore. Um, I, I expect him to OV this week into Arizona. Uh, he For mm-hmm. some time now, he has been considering swapping out that Washington OV for an Arizona OV. So I okay, would expect talked him about in that Arizona. before. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, and Arizona State, SMU, they're also in the mix, but it's really just with Washington out of the picture now, it's those four schools. Arizona, Arizona State, SMU, and Oklahoma. One of those is not like the others. <laughs> Saying Oklahoma is not like the other three. Yes. Yes. No, you're correct. I I guess, what is this? You've talked to him. If you were put a pick in right now, would you pick Oklahoma? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't pick Oklahoma. SMU? Just, yeah, I think I would probably go SMU because his cousin, Chinadu Onyegaro, the four-star edge rusher from out there in Cali, I know mm-hmm. they're – and he has been upfront with me about it. They they'd like to play together. It's not the end all be all. It's not something that they're going to force. But there's an opportunity to do so at SMU, and they both really like SMU. Was well, the SMU. ACC even going to be together? And is SMU? I don't know at this place. Point, but obviously, go? SMU is also in a position where they can make make it worth their while, right? That they are. They are making. And from the Oklahoma side. Yes, that's Jaden O'Neal's teammate. Yes, it would make a lot of sense. And I like I, I do think they're prioritizing him. I I do get the sense that they are recruiting him hard, but we know who priority A1 is, right? Priority A1 is Elijah Melendez. Yep. And so Elijah Melendez is where the bulk of Oklahoma's recruiting efforts at linebacker are going to be concentrated. They're still gonna go after a Hennachor. They're still gonna go after Christian Jones. Heck, if one of those guys wants to commit, there's a good chance they'd take one, right? But yeah. you're always going to leave the light on for Melendez. Always. He's going to have the green light no matter how long he wants to drag this thing out. And I wonder, I genuinely wonder, because I don't know, I wonder how long he chooses to drag this thing out. The vibes I'm getting with Melendez right now are that that commitment to Miami probably doesn't stick you don't so, think so even though he's taking an ov to miami this weekend I, I, I don't think so and again miami has their ways of making sure a guy doesn't walk but if it, if indeed he backs off the pledge to miami you're going toe-to-toe with old miss and auburn and i think we might have talked about this on the last pod brandon but OU right around this time every single year during the Brent Venables era has been waging a war for one of the absolute top linebacker recruits mm-hmm. in the country. It was Troy Bowles in 2022. They were going up against Georgia. It was Sammy Brown up uh, in 2023. They were going up against both Georgia and Clemson in 2024. They're waging this war with Elijah uh, or for Elijah Melendez with Ole Miss and Auburn, if indeed he decommits from Miami. Ole Miss and Auburn, those are SEC schools, Brandon. They are SEC schools with an element of tradition. 
The NIL offering will be substantial from both of those programs, but Ole Miss and Auburn are not exactly the Godzillas that Clemson and Georgia are when it comes to recruiting elite defensive mm-hmm. talent. You will much or you you would much easier take your chances against Ole Miss and Auburn than you would against Georgia for Troy Bowles or Clemson yeah. for Sammy Brown. Right. Like they, you're you're more confident in that case. I, I would agree. I, I think if you're Oklahoma, I think if, if push comes to shove and he, he walks away from the Miami official visit and is just like, I'm still pretty open. And he keeps saying from everything that I've been told, he's been really open with Oklahoma about, look, you guys are up there. Like I am, this isn't a bull crap visit. This isn't me trying to raise my price or anything like that. Like I'm legitimately interested in Oklahoma I love the Brent Venable aspect. I love the fact that he is a developer of linebackers throughout his career. It shows uh, his track record is impeccable. And then you throw the Zach Alley dynamic into it. And yeah, he's a brand new DC and he's a, he's a bit different. If you will, like he's, 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 he's BV part two, you know, like you have to, understand their personalities. Some people vibe with them. Some people don't. It seems as though Melendez vibes very strongly with both those guys. And then when you add the Zach out or you add the Jay Valai, Todd Bates dynamic to it, you got a kind of a, a good balance, right? Of intense and then really personable, right? Now BV is a really personable guy, but he's an intense personable guy. Whereas you have the two, I guess, what would you, when Todd Bates and Jay Valai walk into a room, they're going to own it. And they're going to own it in a very much different way than Brent Venables is going to own the room. Yes. They're going to own it because they're the life of the party. They're going to smile and you're going to want to walk up and give them a hug. Like that's just who they are. And so like, they're just very open, very, I don't, I don't even know how to, how to, describe it they're intense guys yes but they're they're, but they're very they feel like they could be your best friend when you talk to them yeah they're smooth man they're very smooth yeah that's a good like very smooth (laughs) if i can uh well no maybe i shouldn't do that i was gonna say if i was gonna put it in the office terms they're like the uh danny cordray and jim halpert the really smooth salesman um, yeah. And I was going to say Brent is David Wallace, but that makes him seem unlikable. And <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to draw that parallel. No, I, I'm trying to think of keys to Brent is like Kevin with the food. Just super intense, but likable. Like when Kevin sees food, he's intense about it. Right. Like he, I, that that might even be a more unflattering comparison than David. I don't Wallace. know what I, you threw the office, <laughs> and I'm trying to find it. That is the most intense aspect of it. I, I mean, what's another good one? Um, I don't know, man. We we don't have to go down this rabbit hole. There there might not be an exact office comp for Brent Venables, but he's not Brent, Dwight because Dwight. Well, no, no, absolutely. No, I'm just kidding. There. I'm just kidding. I just want to see if you were going to go there with me. <laughs> All right, next. I don't know. That's a, that's a, that's a good in the comments. If you were going to compare the personalities of the OU staff and what you all know, please. Yeah, but you you would use so. you would use the adjective suave to describe yes, Jay they're and Todd smooth. Bates. Yeah, they're smooth. Um, that's that's not Brent Venables, and they both like have the ability. I'd say Brandon to... Hall is Jim Halpert, by the way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, yeah. But no, Brent's just. I mean, Brent exudes power, but not in an overwhelming type of sense, right? Like, Very true. You don't yep. feel like, oh, no, this dude's going to crush me under his iron fist if I step out of line. Maybe sometimes you do feel that uh, as a if member you, of the if, media. But if, but, but if Brent was Michael Scott, would would, would uh, Zach Alley be Dwight if he was the mini? No, still no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just we're, trying to we're make grasping like, at straws here. We're grasping. We're grasping. I'm trying. I'm trying. 
Great show, by the way. Great show. Fantastic show. All right. Anyways, back to recruiting. Sorry that we totally went off track there for a minute. Um, I talked to Michael Vasusi oh, quite yeah. a while, actually. Um, and what'd you get out of that? I, I got like he announced that he was going to Oregon at a different date, and I'm not sure that is going to take place. Like that's what I, I, I kind of got that vibe whenever I was talking to him, and I've I've reached out to Fasusi to ask him like, when are you? rescheduling your Oregon visit this week because he was supposed to go Tuesday through Thursday and then Friday through Sunday it was supposed to be no maybe it may be an end season but I can't I don't think that's going to be possible if what I know and I'm not going to say it publicly right now if what I know is what I know about his commitment timeline I cannot see it being an in-season visit. Now, maybe it's a late July visit. That's possible. But he has a church camp that he's going to before the football season. And the party in the palace is still kind of on the docket potentially for him as well. So I say that, and everybody kind of saw where he called Bill Beanbow the goat, right? Like Hashtag the goat. The goat. And I asked him, like, why? Why did you call him that? And I'm going to paraphrase it because I'm going to put it in my my write-up on OU Insider. And he basically just said, have you seen the NFL? <laughs> have you seen the first round lately? He goes, not only is he intense and a good developer, but he cares. And he doesn't just care about me. And what I become on the field, he cares about my family and their well-being, like, in a roundabout way. He said on the visit, Coach Biedenbo made his family feel so at home, and that staff was so organized in what they were doing and what they were showing his family that he couldn't help but have a good time. Like, he was... Oklahoma did more than what I expected. Now I'm not going to sit here and say I think OU leads. I Texas is going to be hard to beat. I think that's something people need to realize. But he's not originally from America. Yeah, and I'll say that his commitment date has a lot to do with when he came to America with his family. And around that time frame, as far as dates go. So I don't know that they're going to deter from that timeline. It felt like it feels like this is a Texas Oklahoma battle, man. I'm not going to lie. Like, yeah, I think Missouri will try to do all they can to stay in this thing and really push. Uh, And I would probably say they are third right now, but I mean, I'm trying not to say too much is what I'm trying to do here. But what he did tell me was that Oklahoma with his relationship with the people in Norman, mind you, Jaden Hardy is a very dear friend of his and on the OU roster right now, played with him at Louisville. Um, the relationship that that Louisville staff has with the University of Oklahoma, but the fact that a lot of them are OU grads, or and or from like more Oklahoma or the Oklahoma City metro area, there is a certain push there. The flip side of that is Texas, I believe, hired the, a former coach on staff, right? Um. He said there was some sort of relationship with a staffer at Texas that I guess used to be at Louisville hmm. back in the day or recently. I can't. Anyways, um, so there's there's that strong pull, and I, I I've always thought Oregon was kind of a an outlier in this, right? Like 
when you look at everything that that like it was like Texas, Texas A and M, Oklahoma, Missouri, it felt like he wanted to stay kind of within arm's reach of mom and dad, right? Because sure. he was a family guy. People from Africa, North Africa region, Central Africa region, notoriously are very family oriented, and so, um, I believe he's from Africa, correct? Yes. Yeah, I was I was in Nigeria. I thought um, I always get him and can't remember the Jamaican kid I'm confused. Like as far as like, uh, who's the kid from Jamaica that I'm thinking of? I have no idea. There was an O lineman, maybe 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 in last last cycle, but I always get those two kind of confused on where they're from. But yeah, he was talking about you know just moving over here and how big a deal it made for him uh, and just the whole dynamic of football with his family, because you have to also understand like his, this is, this thing is all brand new to his family. Like the football aspect. Yes. They've been around it since they've moved to America, but the celebrity part of it has been very, very eye opening for them as a family. So he's handled it really well. He's a great kid. Um, he's got some really good leadership on that Louisville staff. I think Oklahoma is quietly creeping up there. Now, I would still pick Lamont Rogers if I was going to pick as far as who was going to end up in the class. I know you said Ty Haywood, but as things continue to stay a little in question with Ty Haywood, I guess I want to ask you, he did not show up this weekend. We have not got confirmable exact date on when he's going to arrive. We are assuming it is the 18th through the 20th midweek visit with um, Lamont Rogers, right? That's what we're assuming. And I have talked to some people from the Denton Ryan area, and they said mom's doing much better. But are you still sticking with the Haywood pick? Are you going to lean over? Are you going to come over to my side with Lamont Rogers? What if I want to say Fasusi this week? By all, all means, of... do it because because this is why I actually have contemplated, have contemplated saying I think Fasusi is going to end up in this class. If that happened, I know some people that will be doing backflips and black backflips and cartwheels in the Switzer Center. Haywood has got to actually ov. Correct. Th- that is, and look. There's all this buzz for Oklahoma, and like it's credible buzz, right? Like we, we hear it from people who we ought to believe. If we didn't take those people at their word, Brandon, we wouldn't be doing our jobs correctly. But by the same token, the comparison that I made earlier today was it feels a little bit like Kobe Black. And yes, Ty Haywood's reason for not OVing this past weekend was a very legitimate one. That's understandable. But it was kind of the same deal with Kobe Black last fall when he was when he told OU he was going to show up for a game day and then oh couldn't make it but I'll come next week oh couldn't mm-hmm. make it but I'll come a couple of weeks from now and that happened like four or five times before you eventually just realize okay he's never coming now I don't necessarily think the exact same is true in Haywood's case but how many times over the course of the spring and summer Has there been an expectation, even if something of an abstract one, that, oh, Ty Haywood's going to be back on campus here soon? And still, to this point in the calendar year, Brandon, Ty Haywood has not visited the University of Oklahoma. Yeah, I'm not holding my breath on anything with Ty Haywood at this point. I I, I feel like this is it. They, They get to host Babalola. This next weekend, they have Lamont Rogers coming in in the middle of the week. It's going to be one of those guys. And right now, I, I think it's Lamont Rogers or Basusi that ends up in the class at this juncture. Like, I think that's that's where this is heading. Now, watch after we release this or whatever. We get done recording. Haywood comes out and says, I'm coming in on such and such date. And yeah. Our foot's in our mouth. What? Whatever. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. At the time of this recording, we cannot get a confirmable date. 
Babylon me, is an enormous wild card to me because huge. we have talked about him less than the other three, but the Stanford buzz is interesting and it almost intrigues me more as to whether Oklahoma can actually make a push for this kid because if he is that high on Stanford, it's not for the money because they're not paying. Mm-hmm. It's either for academic prestige or it's for culture. Mm-hmm. Now, academic prestige, if you're not Stanford University, you're going to have a tough time going toe-to-toe with Stanford University in that department. Yeah. But if part of the draw for Babalola to Stanford culture is culture, then there's an equally appealing option, Brandon, that is significantly closer to Overland Park, Kansas than Palo Alto, California. And that is the University of Oklahoma. So I don't necessarily have any expectations when Babalola shows up. I don't think anyone should have expectations, but Mm -hmm. that no doubt is a recruitment that I'm going to be monitoring closely as he gets to town this Friday and he leaves on Sunday just to see what kind of a uh, a legit push Oklahoma can make there. Because I do think there is the potential that they do make a legit push. Uh, And I'm, I'm here to tell you, and I guess I want to ask you for, well, I'll go with Rogers first and then I'm going to ask you this question. Cause I've asked you every podcast and I want to see if you're, you're kind of coming around to a different tune just yet. Lamont Rogers obviously will be in the middle of the week. He could be the only offensive lineman unless Ty Haywood, you know, is there taking his OV at that time between the 18th and the 20th. Yeah. From people I've talked to, that is something that has intrigued them in a massive way with Oklahoma to the point that they feel like there's people around Lamont Rogers that feel like that could be kind of the icing on the cake for Oklahoma, having him around, just being the only guy that the offensive line guys are dealing with and recruiting. The red carpet is completely laid out for him and not having to share because at every visit he's gone to, he's had to share with two or three other offensive linemen. Yeah. If he is the lone guy, that could be massive, massive, massive for Oklahoma. And no, he's not ranked as high as Fasusi. He's not ranked as high as Babalola or Ty Haywood. The ceiling, the, though. The ceiling, other than he has a lower floor than them. The, all three of those guys have a higher floor. I don't know that they have a higher ceiling. And I've asked people around Norman if they feel the same way. You know, and it's not coaches or anything like that, but like people that deal deal with the evals and scouts and stuff like that. And there's some people that feel that Lamont Rogers may have the highest ceiling in the whole class. Now, that means he would be an all pro, right? At the end of the day, if what they say or an all conference guy or all American. The thing is, is Fasusi, his floor. His his floor to ceiling ratio may not be as wide, but his floor is so high that he's already at that yeah. level that he could come in and start, be a freshman All American, end up being an All American within two or three years, and being a top five draft pick at the end of the day. That is that's for Susi. Haywood may never get to that, or excuse me, Rogers may never get to that point, but he may have a freakishly ridiculous pro career in a very, very good college career. So that's kind of where they're talking about, like, there's levels to this. The athleticism that Lamont Rogers brings to the table, there's none other when you look at what he can do in the basketball court and just his footwork. But the thing is, is he's got a slider frame, right? Yeah. You know, He who doesn't he is, really Brandon? have the impact. So you know what? who he is? He's Tyler Guyton. There and therein lies the the ceiling. Like Tyler Guyton, everybody talked about there's nobody as athletic as him. Yep. Nobody. And he proved it. And it was all like until Tyler Guyton actually cracked the lineup at Oklahoma, it was all ceiling talk, right? Because yep. that's all you really had to go off. Yeah. Was that ceiling. And so- well, Mont Rogers is in a position where he doesn't have to transition from defensive line or tight end. No. Or like 
Like he he is an offensive tackle, and he's going to be an offensive tackle, so there won't be an adjustment period there. But mm-hmm. I think physically there are a lot of similarities there to Tyler Guyton. And so if you liked Tyler Guyton and the lump of clay that was and is Tyler Guyton in Bill Biedenboe's hands, then there's a lot to like about the potential of landing Lamont Rogers. And he'll get if he if he was to choose Oklahoma, he would get him at a much younger age and be able to develop him much quicker. Because yeah, you of get that. him for at least three years, probably four, yep. as opposed to two. Yep. Uh, I, so now, having said all that, you, we we know the situation with Babalola. We know the situation with Ty Haywood, or the confounding situation, or the confusing situation of Ty Haywood. Um, we know Lamont Rogers. We know Michael Fasusi in Oklahoma. And Oklahoma is surging for Fasusi right now. Just absolutely surging. Not to the point where I would put put a pick in, but to the point that I'm now willing to be open to the fact that he may end up in the class. Um, and and at one point I actually had him and predicted in the class because oh you led for the longest time. This kind of felt like it was a reminder of everything that he loved about Oklahoma and Oklahoma tried to hit on all those bullet points while he was in Norman over the last three days. So. You know all that, and you've been pushing Missouri is going to end up with one of the four. Do you still feel that way? Yes, I do. I absolutely okay. do. Who, If you were to pick right now, who is it? Because where, whoever they get, if it's not Babalola, there was a complete wrench in things. Yeah. Yeah, no, I hear you. I would, mm, as of right now, pre-visit, I would still say Rogers. Let's see, let's see what happens on this visit, and maybe my. And I can see that because it feels like Oklahoma and Missouri are trying to go tit for tat for Rogers right now, so that that makes sense. Um. Yeah, I, I, I kind of feel you on that. Um. Did we miss anybody? Did we miss talking about somebody else? Um, we, let's, I mean, let's, before we go into the champion barbecue. Yeah, well, sure. Let's think. Uh, we haven't talked about Floyd Bucard. And oh, yeah. If yeah, you are listening to this on Tuesday morning, there is a good chance that there is already an interview with Bucard up on OUinsider.com mm-hmm. from our man, John Garcia, down in the state of Florida. Uh, rivals national southeast recruiting analyst mm-hmm. he talked to bucard again that is scheduled for publication tuesday morning so depending on where when you're listening to this it may already be up it may be on the precipice of getting posted regardless john has the scoop on bucard uh so a- again that's not a recruitment where i think we're going to actually know anything until probably a couple weeks after official visits wrap up yeah i think uh, his commitment date right now is set for July 20th, and Garcia has said there's a chance that gets pushed back. So uh, not one that you're probably going to get a final verdict on anytime soon. So I have to tell you, if things start getting pushed back, I, I, it, it, that feels like the anti-Oklahoma guy. Because mm, yeah. BV is very, very apt on. He likes guys that are good about decisions. Well, and if it stretches into, say, late July... Um, when the dead period opens up and gives Bucard the opportunity to visit somewhere else unofficially before making a decision it back to Miami, he's down probably the street. going back to Miami <laughs> or he's going somewhere closer to home, like Alabama. Um, yeah. So that it, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. Everyone did a good job we'll on the visit. Let's just say that. Like yeah, they, no, did they, did good good they did a good, they did a good, they did a good job. Um, I, Again, we 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 talked about it, an overreaction by the industry with USC, and I still feel that way. I I think if you were going to pick one of the four programs, five programs that he's looking at, USC would be last on my list right now. Is that fair? I don't think USC gets that kid. I yeah, me I will continue to affirm that. Um, so also. Just to clear things up on Cade Petjack, not expecting an announcement or a decision there 
for at least another week or so. Um, so the initial thought was Wisconsin and Oklahoma will be the only two visits uh, he took. And that was even the expectation of the Nebraska and Kansas State camps. But uh, he decided to take those visits. So he was at Nebraska this past weekend. He'll be at Kansas State this upcoming weekend. Nobody, and I mean nobody, in the camp of any of his four final contenders has any belief other than that he will commit to Oklahoma. That mm-hmm. is the overwhelming consensus at this point. And so, yes, he's going to be in Manhattan this weekend for his final official visit. Yes, I guess there is always the opportunity for things to change. But right now, the full expectation for us and for many others is that Cade Petchak, the three-star defensive end from West Fargo, North Dakota, does wind up in the Sooners class when his official visit slate is finished. Yeah, so... Let's talk about the champion barbecue real quick. Okay. So I I have the list. If you would like did, me to run it down. So, go ahead. I have a list too, but go ahead. You 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 name your list and I'll So you have we'll all the commits minus Trent Wilson, who will be this past weekend. Mm-hmm. You have all the all the commits. You have Andrew Marsh and Manny Choice, and we've talked about. We've discussed Christian Jones. Uh We've discussed Andrew Babalola. Max Granville is still technically on the list. Um, is he being though? I look. Even if he does, I I expect him to be a Texas A and M Aggie. Isn't I that weird how that expect. went, man? Because for the longest time, it was like, yeah, Oklahoma is going to be impossible to beat. And now it's A and M. So I just I, I never really bought Oklahoma with that one. Always, always to me felt like that's one A and M. Like even if they aren't in it in it right now they're gonna get in it there's something just about because of where it's from. then christian yeah. academy yeah. man then at warren was kind of the same deal last year where felt like oklahoma was in a good spot and then things started trending away so yep um i don't think i i don't think either of us ever future casted max no we didn't it, um just... now on the other hand uh smith Arogbo has already announced that he's going to be committing on July 1st. His final four are Oklahoma, Texas Tech, Texas, and Washington. The buzz is on the Red Raiders there, which makes no. sense. I mean, I think we've reported since February, maybe in January, that it was OU and Texas Tech that looked like the two schools that were out in front of the field for Smith Rogo, even though it was a little unclear as to what his actual top tier was. OU and Texas tech did have the relationships and it just kind of felt like they had uh, a leg up there and tech to their credit has recruited him, recruited him very hard, recruited him very well for much longer than Oklahoma has. So if he is a red Raider, you get it. Um, it feels like, feels like tech just by virtue of how hard they grind in the relationships game. They get a couple of those kids every year that on paper, you just figure like, why is that kid going to tech? Mm-hmm. Micah Hudson doesn't really count. We, we we know why Micah Hudson went to tech, but there are a few of those kids in Texas tech's class every year that are one with relationships and you tip your cap to Joey McGuire and his crew for that. So uh, we'll see if Oklahoma can turn the tide there, but uh, I I don't really think they need to. I'm not even convinced they would want to because that kind of just muddies the waters, Brand. And you have C.J. Nixon. The expectation is he's a lock this weekend, and you have Cade Petchak who will be defensive end number three in the class if all goes according to plan. So, yeah, uh, there's that. The other three official visitors on tap. Well, and I guess I should probably double check on Kamar Archie. I haven't heard anything there in quite a while, but he was on the champion barbecue list for, I I mean, that official visit was set back in March. So he might still be on tap for a visit. I need to loop back around and confirm that. But the three official visitors that are uncommitted that we haven't already discussed and that you need to focus in on, um, keep an eye on Christian Evans, the four-star defensive lineman from Ashburn, Virginia. Christian Jones, the four-star linebacker from Omaha, Nebraska. And Omarion Robinson, four-star safety from Little Rock, Arkansas. Brandon Brown and Isaiah Gibson as well. And those guys. Yeah, two guys that are flip candidates. So Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Gibson obviously committed to Georgia. Brandon Brown committed to Texas. No, Gibson is USC. <laughs> He's from Georgia. That's hilarious because in my mind, he is not committed to USC. <laughs> No, That's because how... he's not going to USC. No, like, he's absolutely all... not. In we my all mind, know this. He's already... I I think he winds up in Georgia. Um, You're probably right. He's got Ohio State and Oklahoma this week. Uh, Oklahoma has been quietly the dark. There are people worried about Brandon Brown in Oklahoma, by the way. Which I mean, like they Texas just surprised is worried. everybody. Texas they just surprised is everybody worried. with Marcus Harris, man. Who's to say they don't surprise everybody again with Brandon Brown, a kid that I. <laughs> if you pull Brandon Brown off and you miss out on Floyd Bicard, I think you're okay, and you end up landing Christian Evans. Yeah, Christian you feel Evans pretty to good me is about a must that. get. Like you got to get Christian Evans. I think Christian Evans. If there's one guy this weekend that you have to lock down, because I think Oklahoma is getting a Marion Robinson sooner or later. I agree. Probably overdue I... for a future cast there. Um, I think, have I put a future cast in? You have not. Neither of us have. Oh, that's right. I didn't. And there's reasons why I have not done that. And it's not because I don't think he's getting, I went out and visited Amari and Robinson, talked to him in person, have a fairly good relationship with the kid. He will be a sooner. That said, and I, I said that kind of definitively, let me wind that back. I feel like he'll be a sooner. Now, Arkansas has been, creeping up his teammate committed to Arkansas. Arkansas is trying to bank on that fact, helping them. Uh, but but Arkansas is Arkansas. Arkansas right is Arkansas, Arkansas, and I think Oklahoma is going to – and I think Oklahoma is going to make it very clear to Mario Robinson that they – going there would be a bad move. And the fact that you don't even know who's going to be coaching you next year, let alone, you know, will that coach even stick around? Because Arkansas has, goes through coaches like most people go through underwear. And every day, it was a joke. Like everybody switches underwear on a regular basis and they do. Backing. Coaches. Anyways. Um, it, it, it's it's a very let's just say Oklahoma's done a really good job with mom with a, a Marion Robinson uh, dad and uncle are also on board with Oklahoma this visit is to kind of reiterate that I would say get some Nil details ironed out and I I would be shocked if he's not a sooner when it comes time for his decision now. Arkansas is probably I think the worst a worst case scenario for Oklahoma is they fire Pittman around November and they go and get this name and you know the buzz that oh come to Arkansas it's going to be completely different we're going to throw nah. all this money at you that type. that is a worst case scenario for Oklahoma with Amari Robinson and it's probably going to happen that's where Oklahoma is going to have to hold on for dear life. Um, but first you got to get him committed and that's kind of the goal this weekend. Uh, like I said, with Gibson, it feels like, feels like Georgia never felt like he was going to stick with USC, but it also feels like Oklahoma is just kind of, and people have talked about it. Like Oklahoma is kind of that quiet, kind of just lurking in the background, the new SEC team, the the team with that has a really strong relationship in the Warner Robins area uh from their time at Clemson. So there's that. And then Brandon Brown is just like you you brought up the, the Marcus Harris is a really good analogy and comparison. Brandon Brown was that's a shock OV. Like that big time is something that we didn't see on our radar. And I don't think a lot of people did until he came out. I was like, yeah, I'm taking OV to OU. And now you have Texas reporters literally asking, is he and, and fans going, is he gonna stick? And there's some yeah. there's some doubt there right now. Some yeah. legitimate doubt that Oklahoma can, well, it's his final OV. And LSU is in the mix too. Yeah, for Amari Robinson, LSU is very much in the mix for Amari and Robinson. And you may have been talking for Brandon about Brandon Brown as well, is yeah. what I'm talking about. Um 
So yeah, that'll it'll be interesting to monitor that situation because I mean, hey, like we, we we saw what happened with Marcus Harris last week, nope. so you can't rule anything out at this point uh, with Brandon Brown. But uh, don't think Christian Jones' recruitment comes to an end anytime soon. So regardless of what happens this weekend, I think there's a long way to go for everybody in that race. And I think, man, you got to have Christian Evans. Got to have him, especially if he doesn't end up OVing Penn State. Mm-hmm. You got to beat North Carolina, Virginia, and Virginia Tech, man. Like that, that that's a non negotiable at the University of Oklahoma. That Agreed. has to happen. So uh, that's another one about which we will have plenty of updates and nuggets over at OUinsider.com as that visit goes down in real time. By the way, um, and it, it kind of got buried in the news cycle. Because it happened amidst a lot of other craziness, and there's been a lot of craziness that has ensued since. Joe John Finley got a 2026 commit on Saturday. Mm-hmm. We completely glossed over that. Uh, and he's a good one, man. Ryder Mix out of Frisco Lone Star High School right now is a yeah. three star at the moment. He will not be a three star for very long. The offer list smooth. alone will tell you that. He's so smooth. And it felt like it felt like it was leaning in that direction, like Oklahoma and the staff. They were all over him the whole time. I, I thought, I thought him and I thought Trinae Washington were phenomenal at tight end the other day. Phenomenal. If you're worried about 2025 tight ends, look right down the road to Carl Albert. That dude, Trinae Washington can flat ball. And there are a lot of people in that switcher center that were questioning whether he was going to be able to fit what they were looking for. And then you get, you see how big he is now, like with his frame, his shoulders, like he's a good 210, 215. And this dude plays corner and safety and wide receiver folks. Yeah. He'll play. T- <laughs> he'll be, he's able gonna to play, play tight end. end. Yeah. He's going to be a good one. I think Oklahoma went, you just saw a collective sigh of relief after they watched and like, oh gosh, okay. Yeah. You don't feel and as bad about how things have turned out at tight end because you have a good one, a four You star. do have a good one. And even if you're like, okay, Trist, or I'm sorry, Trinae Washington, small potatoes, whatever, even if that is your cynical take on OU's uh, 2025 tight end recruiting, here's the deal, man. Sure, you got 2025 here, but it's sandwiched in between Devon Mitchell in 2024 and Ryder Mix <laughs> and Ryder Mix in 2026. Kind Ryder of, Mix is really good. That kid had an Oregon offer. He had a Penn State offer. He had an Ohio State offer. He had a Tennessee offer. He had 20 other offers too. That is a good football player. And it shows up on tape. He is a very, very multifaceted in his game. He is not a one-dimensional tight end. He's not a strictly inline guy. He's not a strictly pass catching guy. He's a guy that can do all of what is required of the tight end in any offense, and particularly in Oklahoma's offense, where the tight end is utilized heavily. Yeah, uh, I think you 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 said it really well. I thought that the interesting thing was in between Devon Mitchell and Ryder Mix, and then you have. Bauer Sharp, who had everybody in their dog wanting him out of the transfer portal, and Jake Roberts. So the it kind of kind of foo foos all over there. You know, Joe John Finley is a crappy recruiter. He's not Emmett Jones. Who who is Emmett Jones? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's not Todd Bates, he's not Brandon Hall. Like, you know, like those are different. That's 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 a different level of recruiting. And, you, and look, it, it, when you're recruiting tight ends, you don't need to be, right? Because you're recruiting you one, maybe two be, guys yes. a year. You're not recruiting four and five. You're recruiting one or two guys a year. And he's a co-OC, so he's also has like a big umbrella of having to go help with the wide receivers and the running backs with the Marker Murray and the offensive line with Bill Beanbo, right? Like he's got – he and Seth, not only do they focus on their position, but they've got a big umbrella of having to go in there and sit and talk with all those recruits and be like, this is what we're going to do offensively. This is how we're going to use you. Like there's different, they're, they're stretched a little bit more than other staffers. So you also have to take that in consideration as well. So, um, yeah, big weekend ahead, man. And we got a big camp tomorrow. 
a big camp or Tuesday, and then we got a big camp on Thursday. We're going to have all that for you guys right here on this channel, OU Insider VIP. So make sure you're subscribed to that because we got a lot of that. We got a lot of podcasts coming up. We're going to have some commitment. I have a really cool interview that I'm working on. I don't want to say who it is, but it will be taken care of hopefully over the next few days. Um, and one, I think you guys will like, so make sure you're right here on it's this not channel. A three star. I'll just say that much. Uh, it is not a three star. <laughs> and so, um, we're going to have that right here for you on this channel. So make sure you subscribe, make sure you hit the like, the notification for all of our podcasts, whether it's Barry and Mac, whether it's Jesse and Brody, Jesse and Brian, um, whether it's the Oklahoma Jill, whether it's in the paint, whether it's any video that we have, hit the like, hit the notification, make sure you subscribe right here to this channel. Also, this is the perfect time to sign up to for OU Insider. And I don't want to say anything just yet, but there may be some more sway for you guys to come over to us. Um, but there is a lot of information going on. Uh, this is the time. This is right before SEC Media Day. This is... The official visits are kicking off or, or ending at ending right now. And then it's going to roll into commitment time. So if you want to know what's going on and when these commits are going to happen or what we're hearing, the buzz with players that dictate their official visits, whether it was in the first weekend of June, second, third, fourth weekend of June, uh, that's going to happen. Then you got the party in the palace. You got the Sooners under the stars at the end of July. You got the SEC media day right before that. Uh, and obviously you got fall camp. Perfect time right now to sign up. All the information right here, right now on OU Insider VIP. Tons of tons right now of interviews, chats, of us dropping notes on where OU stands with certain players. There's so much more. What you get right here is just a small, small, small piece of what you get over at OU Insider VIP. So make sure you go over there, $9.95 a month if you want to give us a try or $99.95 for a whole year. Uh, check us out, OUinsider.com. Sign up. Love to have you join the thousands and thousands of other OU fans on OU Insider VIP. All right, that's going to do it. We're going to have another podcast later on this week, but that's going to do it for myself, for Parker Thune. You guys have a blessed day.